This is breaking news. Crimes of victims of gun crimes, and they work. For example, in 2017, the program I'm going to see this afternoon, which sends people to the community in the community to interrupt violence, to mediate conflicts, to de-escalate, succeed in preventing single a, a, a single shooting from occurring in this largest public housing development last year. No shooting for a full year because they engage directly with the community. You know, I know this is a priority for Senator Schumer, which you all are doing here. I, uh, if I hear one more call from him that we need more money for housing and more money for cops, I don't know. I'm going to send them back to you all. But, but all kidding aside, this is, uh, this is a half a billion dollars of proven strategies, and we know we'll reduce crime. Congress needs to do its job to pass the budget. Every one of these folks here and come from Congress are all supportive. But, you know, it's time to fund communities, community police, and the people who are going to protect them. Look, as I said, we're, we're not about defunding. We're about funding and providing the additional services you need beyond someone with a gun strapped to their shoulder, to, to their hip. We need more social workers. We need more mental health workers. We need more people who, when you're called on these scenes and someone's about to jump off a roof, is not just someone standing there with a, with a weapon. It's someone who also knows how to talk to people, talk them down. We can't expect you to do every single solitary thing that needs to be done to keep a community safe. It's time to fund community policing to protect and serve the community. And so I'm also calling for increased funding for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and the U.S. Marshals' offices. I'm confident that if we fund these programs, we'll see a reduction in violence. In the next year's budget, I'm also going to try to double down on this investment. I think I've got a lot of partners here in New York going to help. Mayor Adams, you say that gun violence is a sea fed by many rivers. Well, uh, you know, uh, I put forward a plan to dam up some of those streams. Uh, I'm, you know, you can count on me to be a partner in that effort. And I have the U.S. Attorney, uh, United States Attorney General here with me today. And we put together a comprehensive strategy to combat gun crime in cities like New York, Philadelphia, Atlanta, and many other cities, San Francisco. First, we want to crack down on the flow of firearms used to commit violence. That includes taking on and shutting down rogue gun dealers. At, uh, and it's, it's about doing background checks, it's as well as outright selling uh, uh, of that, making sure the people who are not allowed to have a gun don't get the gun in the first place. And again, for any of the press, any of the press listening, this doesn't violate anybody's Second Amendment right. There's no violation of a Second Amendment right. We talk like there's no amendment that's absolute. When the amendment was passed, it didn't say anybody can own a gun and any kind of gun and any kind of weapon. You couldn't buy a cannon and when the, this, this uh, amendment was passed. And so no reason why you should be able to buy certain assault weapons. But that's another issue. And uh, look, one of the things that we focused on, the Attorney General and I, and we're getting to the point where I think we're going to be able to have a real impact on it, includes going after ghost guns. Ghost guns are the guns everyone in this room knows that can be purchased in parts, assembled at home, no serial number, and can't be traced. And they're as deadly as any other weapon out there. But the fact is, they are out there. And, you know, this spring, the Justice Department, this spring, the Justice Department will issue a final rule to regulate these so-called ghost guns. But there's more we can do. Across the country, police departments report sharp increases in the number of ghost guns found at crime scenes. That's why today the department is launching an, intens an intensified national ghost gun enforcement initiative to determine and deter criminals from using those weapons to cover their tracks. If you commit a crime with a ghost gun, not only are state and local prosecutors going to come after you, but expect federal charges and federal prosecution as well. We've also created a strike force to crack down on illegal gun trafficking across state lines. As the mayor said, as he pointed out, guns that are used to kill people in New York City, they aren't made in New York City. They aren't sold in New York City. They are sold in other places. Today, the Attorney General directed all U.S. attorneys 
in the United States to prioritize combating gun trafficking across state lines and city boundaries. The Justice Department is sending additional prosecutorial resources to help shut down what's referred to, as you all know, to the iron pipeline that funnels guns from shops in states like Georgia to crime scenes in Baltimore and Philadelphia and New York and so many other places. Governor, you worked uh, with the mayor and the NYPD and nine other states to create an interstate task force uh, on illegal guns. That's the kind of leadership that's going to solve the problem. And I'm eager to hear more about that progress. And, folks, the second thing I want to point out is I want to help every major city follow New York's lead to put together partnerships like this one you put together and meet on a daily basis. Every day here in New York City, like this meeting today, federal, state, and local enforcement meet to share intelligence about arrests, shootings from the day before, and work to take those shooters off the street as quickly as possible. Just look around. This was what the partnership looks like, and this is what you put together. And it's an important partnership. We need more cities adopting the same model. That's why today the Attorney General is also directing U.S. attorneys to work with state and local law enforcement to strengthen partnerships like this one and to get repeat gun violence offenders off the street and behind bars. You know, I want more cities and states to use some of the $350 billion we sent to them on the American Rescue Plan to fight crime to keep our communities safe by hiring more police officers for community policing and paying police overtime and purchasing gun-fighting technologies, like the technology that hears, locates gunshots, so there can be immediate response because you know exactly where it came from. The third thing, our plan calls for investing in critical services that reduce crime and violence. Community violence intervention programs, like the one I'm going to see after this meeting, summer school, after-school programs for teens, as the saying goes, the, the teacher taught me, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. We got to have things for these kids to do, jobs for young adults, more school counselors and nurses, more mental health required in school, and mental health substance abuse treatment as well. Fourthly, with someone, when someone finishes their time in prison, all our experience tells us you just can't continue to give them 25 bucks and a bus ticket. They'll end up under the same bridge you arrested them in the first place from. And so I don't want, I don't want them ending up back in prison or being there because they've committed another crime. We need to be able to train for and get a job, find stable housing, re-enter re society, and have a second chance at a better life. My Department of Labor is funding programs to help formerly incarcerated individuals, including young adults, receive the education and training they need and then connect them to quality jobs. I'll keep go doing everything in my power to make sure the communities are safer, but Congress needs to do its part, too. Pass universal background checks, ban assault weapons and high-capacity magazines, close loopholes to keep out of the hands of domestic abusers weapons, repeal the liability shield for gun manufacturers. Imagine had we had a liability. They're the only industry in America that is exempted from being able to be sued by the public. Only one. Imagine had that been the way with cigarette manufacturers. Where the hell would we — where the heck would we be? We'd be in tough shape. Why gun manufacturers? Because of the power of their lobbying ability. It's got to end. End. they got to be held responsible for the things that they do that are irresponsible. And, folks, you know, it's the only industry in America, as I said, that's exempt from being sued. And I think I find it to be outrageous. And, folks, these laws, if we are able to pass them, are going to save lives and, more equally importantly, help you protect one another and protect yourself, put law enforcement in a more a safer circumstance. We have an opportunity to come to get together and fulfill the first responsibility of government and our democracy, to keep each other safe. So I want to thank you all. There's much more to say, but I probably already said so, too much because a lot of people are going to speak. But let's get this done. Let's get this done. And God bless the men and women who put their lives in line every single day to keep our communities safe. 
Now I'm going to turn it over, with your permission, to the Attorney General, Attorney General Garland. General. Thank you, President Biden. As the President said, the Justice Department is doubling down on the fight to protect our communities from violent crime and from the gun violence that often drives it. But we are not doing this work alone. As the President also said, what you see in this room represents the core of our efforts, our partnerships, which are essential to success in disrupting violent crime. Yesterday, when the President and I spoke with the Mayor on the telephone, the mayor talked about the importance of the excellent cooperation he is seeing between the city, state, and federal law enforcement agencies who are represented here. At the Justice Department, we know that the best anti-violent crime strategies are tailored to the needs of and are developed by and in partnership with individual communities. That is why all of our Justice Department law enforcement agencies and all 94 of our United States Attorney's offices, including the two represented by the United States Attorneys who are here today, are working with their partners in state and local law enforcement to develop and implement district-specific anti-violent crime policies. We also know that while many of the public safety challenges our cities face require this tailored approach, gun violence is a universal challenge and one that demands comprehensive action. That is why, as the President said, the Justice Department is taking action to crack down on ghost guns and to hold those who illegally sell firearms to criminals accountable. That is why we are strengthening our firearms trafficking strike forces to disrupt the pipeline that floods our community with illegal guns. And that is why we are sparing no resource in identifying and holding accountable the repeat offenders who are the major drivers of violent crime. As we work in partnership with state and local law enforcement, we are also working in partnership with the communities most affected by this violence. Shortly, President Biden and I will be meeting with leaders of a community violence intervention program here in New York. In 2021, the Department provided over $37 million in grant funding directly to community violence intervention efforts, and we will expand that work in the year ahead. The Justice Department will use every tool at our disposal to protect our communities. We will hold perpetrators of violent crime and gun violence accountable. We will work alongside the communities most affected by that violence and we will work together to build the public trust that is essential to public safety. Before I close, I want to note that in times of crises, both large and small, the American people look to law enforcement to help. And every day, officers like those who are with us here answer the call without hesitation despite the difficulty and the danger, they show up and they put their lives on the line. That is what Detective Jason Rivera and Detective Wilbert Mora did. There are no words I can offer that could capture their bravery or the pain that has been inflicted on their loved ones. What I can say is that the Department of Justice we will seek to honor Detectives Rivera and Mora in the work we do to help keep our law enforcement officers safe as we work to keep our communities safe. I'll now turn the program over to Mayor Adams. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney General. And uh, Mr. President, it's, it's really good seeing you. And uh, how do we get here? Uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., we were in a meeting, and the president pulled me into the Oval Office. And after asking uh, what could he do for the city and our desire to deal with violence, uh, I had a brief uh, nod, and I was about to walk out. And he grabbed me by my arm and turned me around and looked into my eyes. And he says, Eric, what can we do? And I told him the help we needed. 
and I asked him several things, but two of them was one, to come to New York and to speak with our city, state, and federal law enforcement personnel so we could have a 9-11 response to this violence. We came together as a country when international terrorists decided to change our way of life, and we responded. And the response was the same by this president. In August, this room came together some of the finest men and women in law enforcement. And they meet every day to zero in on the violence that is attempting to take our way of life. And I thank you for your response. And Mr. President, I thank you for your response. And then I ask him to go on the ground because it's about intervention and prevention. And prevention are the long-term things we need to do. I ask him to go on the ground with us to meet the crisis management teams, the everyday people who are doing the hard work in alignment with the police department. And today, we're going out to Queensbridge and meet that team, where a young man named Kay Bain is using his skills to bring down violence. And in his area, we saw zero homicides for a period of time. But it was not only because of what he did, it was because of what D.A. Katz did to partner with him by bringing down those known violent offenders. That's the combination we need. And I'm biased, Mr. President, because I have some of the best congressional delegations here in New York. Joining us today, we have the dean of the delegation that's here, uh, Congressman Nadler. We have Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Congressman, Congresswoman Grace Ming, Congressman Tom Swazi, and we have the top Attorney General anywhere in this country, and Attorney General Letitia James, and as you indicated, we have two of the best U.S. Attorneys in the Southern and Eastern District that's here with us. We were so proud to meet with them yesterday, but also a district attorney team. As we see here, Katz, uh, Darcel Clark, uh, uh, McMahon out in Staten, Staten Island and D.A. Brads, a real concerted and combined effort to get this done. And then I think about Congressman Espriot. In his district, well, where the two officers were slain, but also in his district was where an 11-month-old baby was shot while sitting by their, her mother. Also in his district, was where a 19-year-old child working in Burger King was shot and killed. And he was on the ground for each one of those incidents, standing with me as we fought against this violence. The police commissioner and I are dedicated and committed to turning this around. I made the best choice anyone can make in picking a police commissioner. She's the right person at the right time to do the right job, and I'm proud to serve with her. We know how important this is. Yesterday, we gathered at St. Patrick's Cathedral in mourning. Today, here at One Police Plaza, where I walked across that stage as a captain, we're here in solidarity to deal with the issue of violence that has become pervasive in not only New York City, but in the cities across America. And I want to thank all of you for joining me as we pursue this fight to make sure the stain of violence does not destroy our communities. And U.S. Attorney General Garland, I appreciate your commitment and dedication in living up to the promise that was done with your team as we sat in the room with Ambassador Susan Wright and sitting there with the president and other mayors across the city as we deal with this issue. The president is here because he knows what the American people want, justice, safety, and prosperity, and they deserve every bit of it. And he wants to end the gun violence in our city and in our country, in a future built on equality and opportunity because the lack of the two feeds the gun violence that we are seeing. Far too often when we advocate for this, Mr. President, people miss the part that we state we want to end inequality. Let's stop being divisive and united to come together and deal with this fight. We are on the same page. There is a reader's reason they call me the Biden of Brooklyn. 
<laughs> and that's what New Yorkers want, too. That's what I campaigned on, and it's why you elected me as the mayor of the city of New York. And it's what the president came here today to hear from you and to deliver. Last week, my administration released our blueprint to end gun violence. There are many rivers, as you stated, that feed the sea of violence. We must dam every river. One river will cause another death prematurely in our city. And many reasons these rivers have continued to rise in our city and in our country, and we're going to stop them from doing so. But the president and these leaders that are here today, we are going to work together to end this violence in our city and in our country. When President Biden and I first met last summer, we hit it off right away. We had a clear mission, the average Joe, they call him, because we know we have to build a city and a country that's made up of everyday New Yorkers and Americans. He knows that public safety and justice are the bedrock of our economy, our democracy, and our society. And we know who we work for, the people. And that includes the dishwasher, people who wear coveralls, aprons, scrubs, and hard hats, the everyday people who just want to provide for their families and one day go from being a dishwasher, a mailroom attendant, and become a mayor of the city of New York, everyday New Yorkers and everyday Americans. The people who want to raise their families in a city and in a country with good jobs, good schools, and safe streets. We both know our highest calling, our most important mission, is protecting the people of this city and of this country, making sure they have what they need to live their lives in safety, and helping them recover after two years of the devastation of COVID crisis and violence. There is no recovery without public safety. There is no cover recovery without justice. They go hand in hand. That is why we're working in lockstep to end the gun violence that has shaken our city, our nation, to protect our people and the officers who sworn to protect us, and to restore the American dream of safety, stability, and prosperity. That is why the president is here in New York City, in this city, today. He understands how serious this moment is. We need, as I stated, a 9-11 type response to address the domestic terror that is pervasive in this city and country. And President Biden is here to deliver on his promise to come here. He committed to it, and he is here. And get New Yorkers the backup we need. Far too long we called for backup, and it was not here. It is time to have that backup. This morning, the White House announced that the federal government would direct more resources to fight local crime around the country, expand the information sharing model that you are going to witness here today, Mr. President, and call for more funding for Congress for violent interrupters, something that my congressional delegation understands so clearly. We could build back if we pass Build It Back. That is how we built America back and scale up a nationwide response to this public health crisis that is gun violence. That's why we're here today, to bring together our federal, state, and city partners in common cause. We're going to stop gun trafficking from coming into our city, get illegal guns off the streets, and lock up those who carry them and make sure that they don't leave prison or jails without the opportunities they need so they don't have a revolving door of crime in our city and country. We're going to provide funding for cities and states to put more police officers in the places we need them, invest in community violence prevention and intervention programs, and change our laws to prevent crime and save lives and do it in a way that we can disagree without being disagreeable because we are in this fight together. We're going to break and destroy the iron pipeline that allows southern states in this country to produce weapons that end up on the streets and take the lives of our police officers, Mora and Rivera. And I want to, again, take my off, hat off to Officer Summit, 
who protected countless numbers of New Yorkers and responding police officers by taking the appropriate action to end the threat that we were facing. We're going to dam those rivers of violence and address the sources of those violence. It's about more than fighting crime, as Congressman Velasquez reminds us all the time. It's about rebuilding our society. It's not just locking people up. It's about picking them up and giving them the opportunity to do so. That is why the American people elected Joe Biden to lead them. That is why we're willing to follow that leadership. And that is why I'm proud to be here today among the men and women who wore that same uniform that I wore, to stand shoulder to shoulder with the president. And we want to get stuff done. That's the administration of the Biden's administration and the Adams administration, to get stuff done for the American people. And Mr. President, Eric Adams is reporting for duty and ready to serve. Thank you. Eric. I'm going to turn it over to our governor. Thank you, Mr. President, for participating here today. Can you hear me now? All right. All right. Mr. President, life is all about showing up. And on a day when you had a deal with an international incident where the rest of the country was riveted on the news that was coming out of the White House, you still found the time to show up. And to me, that is a commitment that we will not take for granted. It's more than just words. It's a sign of your desire to really be a partner with all of us, as I am with the mayor of New York and with our district attorneys and the New York State Police and the NYPD, who I said today, it is so refreshing not to see you sitting there with tears in our eyes in St. Patrick's Cathedral, as we have been doing far too often. So, Commissioner, I want to thank you for leading an incredible team. I'm proud of my team at the state level. We also have other state partners. We have our great Attorney General, Letitia James, is here. Mr. Attorney General, thank you. We think you're doing a great job with the country. We've got the all-star right here in our own state as well, as well as all the elected officials who I had the privilege of serving with in Congress a decade ago. This is the team that has to be activated because we cannot wait a single day longer. Because the challenge that lies before us, it's not unique to New York State. It is not unique to this city. It is an American crisis. But what we're doing here in the state of New York and in the city of New York can be used as a model for other parts of our country to show them what real collaboration looks like. I've been in this business a long time, and I have seen that people get into silos. Federal government's going to handle this case. The prosecutors over here and the local government and district attorneys are over here, and the state government has a different role. For the first time in my life, I'm seeing a unification of purpose that has been missing. And the ones who ought to be afraid of that are those who dare violate the laws that are in place to protect the people of our cities and our state. But also, there are people who are hurting in this community. We saw an incredible increase in violence immediately following the pandemic. It appears to me the human condition was very frail. We have people who have succumbed to suicide, substance abuse, domestic violence, and even, yes, acquiring a gun on the streets for $1,200 and using it against one of their fellow men or women. We have to figure out the root causes here. And that is why, in my budget, I not only triple the amount of money to support our law enforcement activities and community policing, but triple the amount of money being spent on the exact kind of programs we're all talking about here is figuring out what is happening when young people are faced with that decision that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Do I stay on the straight and narrow or do I succumb to the streets? Where am I going to find my family? We need to provide that family and let them know that there are jobs and opportunities and adults who care about them and the violence disruptors, and I've seen them in action so many times, many of them are former gang members. They're the ones who can speak to them in a way that no one else can. 
So we're continuing to support that. And Mr. President, I want to thank you for the American Recovery Plan dollars. We are spending them on many important causes, but we are dedicating many of them, as you've suggested, to dealing with both sides of the equation. The very human side, where we need to be dealing with the resources and support for these people, but also those who cross the line deal with that and make sure our law enforcement have the resources. With respect to ghost guns, I signed a law just a few months ago that banned them in the state of New York. And as a series of reforms, we also banned the component parts. And we named that after an individual whose name I'm going to say right now, and that is Scott J. Beagle. He is the brave teacher in that school in Parkland where our children were slaughtered. His family is from Long Island. We named it after him, and his mother was there and gave me this hug and said, we'll never forget Scott Wilby. And I said, never, never, ever. Just as we'll remember other victims, the men and women, like Officer Rivera and Moran, who so proudly wear those uniforms to hear from their families what it meant to them to put on that uniform every day. It was so impactful and powerful to hear their words. We have to fight to protect them as well. So, Mr. President, we're going to find all the smart ways to double down on this. The task force that you reference has already work together collaboratively. Nine states, in addition to the state police, NYPD, your own ATF is represented, Boston Police Department. These counties and states have come together like never before with one purpose. is to stop the flow of guns over our borders because, yes, as governor, I'm going to help my mayors. And I have mayors all over the state who need my help. But my job is to protect those borders because 80 percent of guns in this state are coming from other states illegally. So I'm watching those borders. Let everybody be aware. We are checking. We're out there. We're checking the people who are putting guns in their trunks and gun shows in Pennsylvania, heading north and ending up in Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, Staten Island. It's going to stop right now. That is the message. We have the resources. We have the will. We have the desire to get this done because our citizens are calling on us to protect them so they can feel safe once again in this great city and this incredible state. So, Mr. President, thank you for your time. You being here today sends a powerful message, and we do not forget that you never forgot us at a time when we needed your support the most. And with that, I'd like to introduce an incredible partner that we have representing us, the entire state in Washington, D.C., and that is our Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you for your leadership and your determination to take this scourge of gun violence head on. It really does matter. I want to recognize all my state partners um, who are sitting here with me, our delegation in Congress, as well as our DAs um, and our Attorney General. I want to thank each of you for being here. New York has just lost two officers who were shot and killed in the line of duty. Detective Wilbert Mora's funeral was yesterday. He was only 27. Last week, I attended the funeral of Detective Jason Rivera, who was only 22. They had their whole lives ahead of them. After that, I stood with Jennifer Pryor, a mom who I first met in 2009. Her brilliant, beautiful daughter, Nyasia, was an honor roll student and on the cheerleading squad. One night, when Nyasia was out with her friends celebrating their recent graduation, a stray bullet hit her in the head and killed her instantly. I went to Brooklyn. I met her family. I met her classmates. Losing a child that young is really hard. It's hard for the community, and it's hard for everyone. As a mom of two young boys who are about that age right now, I can't imagine the horror or the pain that a parent lives through to keep going forward every day. And as a senator, I made a commitment that we would take action and do what we could on the federal level to stop the senseless gun violence in our cities, in our state, in our country. Now, New York is, is not unique, but it does have a particular problem. Almost 90 percent of the guns used in crimes in our city are trafficked guns, just as the governor said. So our approach to combating gun violence has to include dealing with these trafficked weapons. Right now, there's literally no federal law that makes it illegal to cross a state line with a trunk full of guns, get on a bus with a bag full of guns, get in your car and drive up the iron pipeline and sell them directly out of the back of a truck 
into the arms of criminals in our city. We have to change that. It's really pretty simple. We have to keep these illegal guns off of our streets, out of the hands of those who could not buy them legally. We have to work hand in glove across federal, state, and local government lines. We have to pass the common sense gun reforms that the president talked about, that our mayor wants, that our attorney general fights for. We have strong partners here. I believe between all of us here to get today, we can do this. The bill that many of us have been working on in Washington is called the Hadia Pendleton and Ayesha Pryor Yard Gun Trafficking and Crime Prevention Act, which would establish gun trafficking as a federal crime and go upstream to address all responsible parties. The traffickers buying the guns and transporting them across state lines, the gun dealers who knowingly facilitate or recklessly disregard the warning signs of gun trafficking, and the kingpins and organizers who plan the trafficking. When similar le legislation was brought up in 2013 for a vote, it got 58 votes. You know in the Senate we have to get 60. It was the closest we got to any common sense gun reform. This is a gun that Commissioner Kelly helped, this is a bill that Commissioner Kelly helped me write. And so I know with our new police commissioner, and I know with our governor and our mayor, and with our president, we can get this done this year. We cannot have more stories of four-year-olds dying on park benches in Brooklyn. We cannot have more stories of moms and their movement speaking out, begging leaders to do what's right. We can do this, and we will. Now I'd like to introduce Hakeem Jeffries. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand, to President Biden, Mayor Adams, uh, Governor Hochul, General Garland, Commissioner Sewell, all my colleagues in government, men and women of the NYPD. President Biden, thank you for your leadership, uh, your partnership, for your presence uh, here in New York City. We believe the greatest uh, city in the world, uh, with apologies to Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> but every great city, of course, has challenges. And the stunning rise in gun violence is a major challenge for us uh, to address. But we recognize, as you have indicated, it's a national challenge. You think about the dynamic that we are confronting here in America, we have 4% of the world's population, but 40% of the world's guns. That means there are more than 300 million guns circulating in the United States of America. And many of those guns, such as the one used to strike down two heroes, Detective Rivera and Detective Mora are weapons of war. They're not used to hunt deer. They're used to hunt human beings. That's not acceptable. Many of those guns too easily fall into the hands of violent individuals in far too many communities, such as many that I represent in central Brooklyn and across America. That's not acceptable, and far too many of those guns are illegally trafficked from other places into this great metropolis. That's not acceptable. So it's an all-hands-on-deck approach that will require tremendous leadership, as is being provided by our president, our governor, and our mayor, and our congressional delegation at all levels of government, city, state, and federal. And the congressional delegation in the House, Representatives Velasquez, Nadler, Espaillat, Meng, Swazi, and others, we stand ready to partner with you to get done what needs to happen to deal with this gun violence scourge with the fierce urgency of now, to make sure that we balance the interests of public safety and that important American principle of liberty and justice for all and invest 
in communities that have traditionally been left behind to create opportunity in every single zip code. A tough moment for us in the city, but we're a resilient community, a resilient city, a resilient country. You can knock us down, but never knock us out, and together we will get this done. Thank you for your leadership, Mr. President. I now yield to my good friend, whose district we are in, here in Lower Manhattan, Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez. Well, I don't know if you can hear me. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Mr. President, it is such an honor and it is so comforting to the men and women in uniform, to the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters who have suffered because of gun violence in our country, to the Attorney General Garland, Governor Hocko, and Mayor Adams, thank you for making it possible, but also in recognizing that it takes all of us working together. To my New York con congressional delegation, I want to recognize the incredible role that we have played in working together with this administration to make sure that we secure the resources, not only to deal with gun violence in our country, but to tackle the issue of the pandemic, uh, to provide relief assistance to small businesses in our country, and I am proud that we have been able to get this economy growing again, that because of the commitment and vision of President Biden. Since the start of the pandemic, gun violence in our city has surged to levels not seen in a decade. Shootings are up by 166% here in New York City. Across the U.S., over 20,000 people were killed by gun violence last year. Black and brown communities, we are victims of gun violence. It takes us also, because we are on the ground. We know what works and what doesn't work. We got the expertise and we need to use all those grass, grassroots community organization who understand the dynamics that play into gun violence in our country. So these statistics are not just numbers. Each represents a lost member of our communities. We must recognize that mobilizing community-based resources, job opportunities, and early intervention are key to protecting our youth from gun violence. We must also, once and for all, crack down on the iron pipeline of illegal guns being funneled into states like New York. This is just not a public safety issue, but one that requires partnerships with healthcare institutions, school, job-creating programs, churches, as Hakeem Jeffrey just said. We are all hands on deck. This is how we're going to tackle this issue. And I want to recognize uh, Losures Anti-Violence Program in North Brooklyn, working with NYCHA, New York City Housing Public um, Authority, and they are working to stem the gun violence issue in public housing. They have been successful. It is proven. It can work. Let's do it. Thank you. And it's my honor to introduce the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Chairman Jerry Nadler. You have it there. Well, thank you very much. I obviously agree with everything that's been said, and I certainly thank the President uh, for his support uh, for the actions he's taking to bring money to New York, for his support of legislation um, in order to solve this problem. 
You know, it is said that um, by the NRA, and I remember 19, in 2004 when we passed, uh, when a Republican Congress passed that bill to exempt gun manufacturers from lawsuits because they were being sued on the model of the um, tobacco companies who had been, who had been uh, sued uh, for falsifying the information about the toxicity of their product. And they managed to pass this legislation, which is still on the books. And uh, the president, who was then a senator, was instrumental in 1994 in getting the assault weapons ban passed. But it was a 10-year bill, and it was, it was allowed to expire in 2004, and I wish we could get it back. The legislation that we have passed in Congress is wholly inadequate. Now, the Judiciary Committee has passed, uh, the House has passed two bills, H.R. 8, which uh, requires a background check on every gun or transfer with limited exceptions, such as family members. We passed the uh, Enhanced Background Checks Act of 2021 la last March, which addresses the Charleston loophole in background check procedures. Um, this loophole is that when an individual attempts to purchase a firearm from a licensed dealer, the FBI has three days to complete a background check, and if the background check isn't completed in three days, he gets the gun, even if, even if the background check would come back in four or five days and say that this person is a dangerous person to have the gun. So we passed the uh, Enhanced Background Checks Act of, of 2021, which allow, which um, addresses this deficiency by providing the FBI additional time to complete background checks, gives notice to the FBI about which cases need to be prioritized for review. And uh, the Judiciary Committee in uh, October of last year, only a few months ago, reported favorably out of committee uh, Lucy McBath's bill, uh, uh, red flag bill, or w which would create a federal extreme risk, or red flag law, as we call it, that would prevent firearms from being accessible to those who are a danger to themselves and others. The bill would create procedures for federal courts to issue extreme risk protection orders to prohibit a person from purchasing, possessing, or receiving a firearm or, or, a firearm or ammunition. Under the bill, a family or household member or a law enforcement officer can petition the court for an extreme risk protection order with respect to an individual who poses a risk to themselves or others. The bill also adds people who are subject to an extreme risk protection order to the categories of persons prohibited from purchasing, shipping, transporting, possessing, or receiving a firearm or ammunition under federal law. Now, in the last Congress, in the 116th Congress, the Senate companion to this bill was introduced by Lindsey Graham. The concept was championed by none other than President Trump in a series of 2019 statements on mass shootings. Um, Senator Graham has not reintroduced the bill yet in the 117th Congress, but we're talking to him. Uh, leadership has expressed support, um, given its bipartisan origins and outreach by Representative McBath and others by committee staff. The bill, we hope, will find Republican support of the House floor. And I believe that this bill is the uh, best hope for legislative action on gun violence in what remains of this Congress. Now, of course, this is wholly inadequate. Um, and that's why everything the President is talking about and the Attorney General is talking about doing by executive order, which should be law, but we haven't been able to make it law, should be done by executive order, and hopefully, uh, eventually by law. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, the entire congressional delegation. Uh, we want to uh, now, I know the police commissioner has to depart to go to the walkout for one of the officers that was shot a few nights ago. Uh, Police Commissioner, if you want to say a few comments, and then we'll turn it over to the task force uh, to give a presentation of what they're doing every day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. President, Attorney General Garland, thank you so much for coming to witness firsthand what the NYPD and our law enforcement partners are doing to end the proliferation of illegal guns and shootings in New York City. 
We know across the cities and major areas in this country they're experiencing an uptick in violence, a growing number of shootings, and guns on their streets, and New York City has not been immune. Experts will lightly debate this for years, but we do not have years. There are too many people carrying guns who are not afraid to use them. Our officers are out there engaging, and they are doing what literally is the most dangerous thing a police officer can do. They are taking guns out of the hands of criminals on our streets, and our officers are paying a heavy price for it. It cannot be overstated that since the beginning of the year, we have had six of our own officers shot, and tragically, two of them killed. And Mr. President and Attorney General Garland, I want to thank you for your outpouring of support and your condolences during this time, during the loss of our members. It's a sincerely appreciated. In fact, again, as the mayor said, we have to excuse ourselves because uh, a little bit of good news, one of our officers is being released from the hospital today, so we're going to head over there. Despite a record number of gun arrests and seizures by the police, the communities and our citizens continue to pay a horrific price. We've seen our citizens suffer from this violence. Bystanders, unintended targets, babies, and people simply trying to do their jobs. We know this violence is not acceptable against our citizens or our police officers. And we know that it has to be stopped. And we know that it starts here, in the NYPD, with action. That is why the Gun Violence Strategies Partnership was started. What you are seeing here today, Mr. President, is every component of law enforcement in New York literally at the table. This morning, we're going to do what this group does every day. We're going to go over the shootings, the suspects, the guns, the shell casings, the facts to connect the dots. They will go around the table. We're going to use every tool, talent, and resource available through every agency to focus on the very few who are responsible for the largest number of shootings in our city. And we intend to use every legal tool at our disposal to remove them from our communities. This is about the life of a city, but it's also about the lives of the people who make up this city. And together, with this partnership, we know that we will not fail. It's an extraordinary meeting. I've been a part of it. These are truly professionals. And I want to turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Chauncey Parker, who's basically like the quarterback of this team. Mm -hmm. Before you do that, Deputy Commissioner, since this is sensitive information, I think at this time uh, we're going to ask the press to depart uh, because this is sensitive information that is shared. And so if uh, personnel could help us 